Okay, welcome back to Green Plum Summit 2020, the reimagined digital customer conference. My name is Jacques Eistock, and my next guest is Scott Kaler. Scott has worked with our customers and prospects for over a decade, and for the past few years, has been guiding various aspects of Green Plum within R&D. Today, Scott is going to dive into some of the recent changes that have happened around mirroring between Green Plum 5 and Green Plum 6. Scott. Hey, Jacques. I just I wanted to put out there that I've been working with Green Plum for about 10 years now, and it's kind of exciting to talk about working with Green Plum because three years of that was as a customer. And I got to see us go from Green Plum 3 to Green Plum 4. And then as somebody representing Green Plum going from 4 to 5 and 5 to 6 and looking what's in 7, it's just been kind of an amazing journey going through all of that and the performance benefits that are out there. So what I wanted to talk about today was uh, the mirroring changes that are in Green Plum 5 going into Green Plum 6. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's been put into this, and most people aren't actually going to see these changes. Like, they're not going to experience them firsthand. That kind of happens behind the scenes. But I thought I'd go through them because they're a great example of some of the things we're doing in Greenplum. All right. So let's talk about our agenda, which is the next slide. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a basic overview, talking about mirroring and replication. Then we'll talk about how it works in five, how it works in six. Then we'll talk about the key things to know as you move to six. Then we'll talk about why we actually changed this, why we made this important change. All right. So the first thing let's talk about, let's talk about our deployments, what a Green Plum deployment looks like. So let's go to the next slide. When you deploy Green Plum, normally you're going to have hosts, and Ivan kind of covered this earlier, you'll have hosts that have multiple Postgres instances on them. Of these multiple Postgres instances, you'll have a primary on one system and then a mirror of that on the other system. So your piece of data will end up in two places. So if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is a very simple Green Plum deployment where we've got two primaries and two mirrors per host. So what, if I have a simple table, like let's say it's the numbers table and Greenplum is going to hash the data across the different primaries that exist out there. So if I put the number one in, it may hash and go into segment one, and it would be replicated to host number two in the mirror for segment one that exists there. If I put number two into the system, it would potentially hash to segment two, which would be replicated over to the mirror, which exists on host number three. Now, the reason that we do this in a lot of hardware environments is because you have all your disk and your information on that one host. And if that host, something were to happen to it, like it were to catch on fire, motherboard goes bad, whatever array of things tend to happen wonky in the data center, you don't lose your data. It exists on the other host. So number one thing is you don't lose your data because we're replicating it to the other hosts. The second piece of that is, is that those mirrors can come online and then start serving that data. So as a user, you can continue to service queries and get the information that you're looking for. You don't have to take an outage during that period of time while that other host is offline. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. So the way that we do this in Greenplum 5 is we use a process called file wrap. Now, a very common thing to do in Greenplum is what we call a CTAS, a create table as select. So you have a big table of users and you wanna create another version of that to mess with as a data scientist, let's say. So in this example, we've got, we have an alpha table, we wanna make a beta table. So we do a create table beta as select star from alpha. So that's, as you create that table, it's going to be replicated across from the primary to the mirror. So what FileRep actually does is FileRep is working behind the scenes. And as that binary data is being written, for I believe for heap tables, it's copying the binary data across. And for AO tables, it's on a block level, it's copying across the binary data. And then what goes into the, the transaction log is just a note that that transaction has happened. So FileRep's actually mo moving things on a binary level and then the wall log or the transaction log is actually has a small notation. The actual tuples that moved are not in the wall log. All right, if we go on to Green Plum 6 now, in Green Plum 6, this has changed. So as you do your CTAS, what happens is all of the tuples that are going into this new table are actually pushed into the wall log. And then in Green Plum 6, what's happening is the, the mirror is consuming the wall log. 
It's reading the wall log and it's using that to recreate the table. So there's a big change there and that you're not copying things over on a binary level. Instead, it's going into the wall log, wall log goes across, and then it's read from the wall log and applied to the system. All right, so if we hop onto the next slide, what we see is there's a little bit of change in the amount of write that's going on because previously we just used to pick the bytes up and move them across and write them. Now we're actually pushing them into the wall log. So we write the wall log, then we have to read the wall log, and then we put it down. So the good thing about this is it's pretty optimized because the wall log is just a big sequential pushing things down. So while there is more read and write going on, this is a pretty optimized type of transaction that's going on. So you will see more write happening in Greenplum 6 than you did in Greenplum 5. Which is kind of a question of why are we doing this? We're doing more write. Why, why are we making this choice? All right, so in Greenplum 5, when you talk about file rep, file reps strongly bound our primary and our mirror together. Um, because we were replicating on a binary level, it was tough to break out and introspect what was going on within that replication system. So usually when problems would come in, they'd end up going into support, into our R&D staff, if we actually had to get in and look at what was going on between the two systems. So this was code that we had to make because WallRep wasn't where, it wa where we wanted it to be at while we were doing primary and mirrors. All right, so let's go on to the next one. If we look at Green Plum 6, what we've got going on, and my white box there is the wall log. Uh, what happens is the primary is creating wall log and the mirror is pulling it out. So what actually happens here is we're kind of breaking the one-to-one -one construct as we're creating the wall log that not only could a mirror pull it out, but looking to the future, we could, as a tertiary system, could potentially pull that wall log. Um, there's a lot of neat tools out there that also look at the wall log and introspect the wall log for information. So we can start to leverage those things that are going on, which is takeaways from this. So there's been a big change from Greenplum 5 to Greenplum 6 in how replication works. And honestly, most people are not going to notice this, but it's it kind of epitomizes the work that the engineers both past and present are doing on Greenplum, which is amazing. Um, there is going to be an increased amount of I.O in Greenplum 6 for replication, but it's highly optimized so that most people will not notice the change in IO. Um, the next thing is the leveraging wall rep brings the GPDB code in line with what Postgres is doing. So we got to get rid of our file rep code, go after Postgres's code base, which allows us to bring on all the enhancements that are happening in Postgres and the tools that people are using outside to work with Postgres and its replication processes. Another thing is the visibility into the replication process. There are a lot of tables and functions inside of Postgres to look at how the replication process is going and see where it's at. Uh, you get to, we can expose all of that now so you can see just exactly how your replication is going between the primary and mirror. And that's a great thing to leverage. I kind of, I kind of talked about the integrations which are going on. And then the last thing is for DBAs, they have a consistent environment between Postgres and GPDB now. So if you know replication in Postgres and you've been dealing with it, it's not a total context change to move over to GPDB and figure out what's going on in your replication. Now, the same things will apply and you can kind of use your troubleshooting steps as a DBA that you use in Postgres in the GPDB world, which is awesome. All right. So that's all I've got for now. I think I will turn it back over to you, Jacques. Thank you so much, Scott. I, I think I, uh, I had some back channel chatter about uh, folks being worried about the whole cluster if a single host actually caught fire. I don't know if you've seen a host mm -hmm. catch fire, but uh, between you and Ivan, I've learned a ton already this morning. So thank you very much.